Greetings everybody and thank you for turning out for World Press Freedom Day. Today marks 30 years since the United Nations inception of World Press Freedom Day. This year's theme from the UN is recentering freedom of expression as a driver of all other human rights. The continued torture of Julian Assange is emblematic of all that's wrong with our society. By creating WikiLeaks, Julian lived up to and enacted upon the Australian ideals of an honest and fair society globally. Today, we're going to try something new. Ask me anything on the Assange case. The concept of the World Press Freedom Day is an Assange help desk, manned by journalists who have had extensive knowledge of his case. As with anything to say, Ask Me Anything assumes that people are mostly informed about the Assange case, but want more detail. Rather than us just passively listening to speeches, Ask Me Anything is interactive. We have a microphone for the public, that's the one standing there. So get ready with your questions. We're fortunate today to have Cathy Vogan share her extensive knowledge for the inaugural Ask Me Anything on the Assange case. Cathy Vogan is an MEAA and IFJ accredited journalist the executive producer of Consortium News in Washington, D.C. Cassie has 30 years of experience in broadcast and creative media production, winning eight awards in Australia, Italy, and Germany. Cathy is one of two Australian journalists allowed into the courtroom for the Assange case. We're fortunate to have her today share her extensive knowledge at the inaugural Ask Me Anything. Please make her feel welcome. I kind of got this idea for, for two reasons. Number one, I'm a courtroom journalist. I've been in the Assange courtroom every day for three years, if you count the pre-trial meetings as well. So I've seen Assange, had eyes on him the day he had his stroke. I can tell you so much about the forensics because I'm a bit technically inclined and I think I'm the only journalist. There's not that many every day in the courtroom. There wasn't maybe about 20 to 40 at the most. Um, but. I'm one who's got that technical uh, background in order to be able to understand what the forensic examiner was saying. Patrick Eller was a chief forensic examiner from Fort Meade. And he was in charge of 17 other forensic examiners. He testified in September 2020, but already in February, this whole hacking narrative it's not even hacking, it's conspiracy to commit computer intrusion. The person who's doing the intruding was allegedly Manning, but that doesn't even make sense because Manning had top secret clearance, didn't need anybody's help. And certainly this idea that uh, her identity could have been disguised with another login, well, that was just impossible. So anyway, that fell to pieces. They went looking for Ziggy. And uh, that fell to pieces as well. The other star witness to try and bring Assange down uh, recanted all of his testimony. So at the moment, that, that part, which is the hook that permits the espionage charges, is hanging by a thread. So that's good news. Any questions, I will I'll do my best to answer. I might have to say I don't know. I might have to say I can't say. But go for it. This is what it's all about. You. <clears throat> what do you think of, uh, of trying to declare a deadline for, for Assange to be freed to begin his rehabilitation from the torture he's been under? I don't know if you can really do that. I mean, at the moment, where it stands is Assange is waiting for an answer to see if he can launch his appeal, his cross appeal. That's where we're going to have him fight for the future of the press. Now, they've been, they've been sitting on that for, since September, so, and they still haven't given a, a decision, but there are 16 points of appeal, 12 in relation to the extradition hearing, four in relation to the Home Secretary's decision. Now, what I think, what I think would, would would make it a fair fight, a quality of arms, is if Assange was given bail. Let him go home to his family. Let him have access to his lawyers. And then, you know, I'm sure he'll say, bring it on. But while he's in that hell hole, he can't even communicate with his lawyers properly. Every call is monitored. And the visits are monitored too, and very few people can go there. 
So he should be out. He's already been refused bail twice. It says that the Ministry of Justice says they, they really shouldn't do it more than twice. Then you, you've got grounds for saying, well, I'm not a flight risk anymore. I've got a young family and legally the ball's going to be in my court, right? So why would he run away from that? So I think he's got really good arguments to get bail. That's what I'd like to see. That's what I'd like the government to fight for. And that, in a way, is what Penny Wong suggested when she said, we're looking into whether the conditions of him being in Belmarsh prison is appropriate at all. We've got to give a citizen, a man, a journalist, a fair chance. And beginning his rehab may be one ground for him receiving bail, even at this late stage. Well, yeah, he could wear an anklet again, uh, but the thing is he could get rehab at the same time. You're right. Next question. Adriana. Considering that the Australian government has intervened in six cases of Australians held in prisons overseas in the past, since 2007, and successfully so, including governments of liberal tendency, why isn't this government doing more to obtain the release of Julian Assange? A very good question. So, for the Belmarsh Tribunal, we've got the statement from Kylie Moore Gilbert, and she said that the Australian government was ready to move mountains to get me free, and they achieved it. Now, there's another person who was liberated, and that's David Hicks. Now, David Hicks, his process, his judicial process wasn't concluded. Penny Wong said we can't intervene when the judicial process is not concluded, but the, they did, and John Howard government did in the case of Hicks. In, in fact, they fixed the outcome. Poor David had to sign a guilty plea and a whole lot of other things that he was allegedly guilty of and said he was innocent. But then he was given something else. I um, don't know how many of you would have ever heard of this because it doesn't exist in Australia, an alpha plea. And that exists in America. So you can plead guilty, but then you can say, well, I pled guilty because I have no chance of winning because of the way the laws are structured, but I am actually pleading innocent. I would wonder if that may not be the deal uh, proposed to Julian, but if I know Julian, I think he wants to do his cross appeal. He wants to fight. This goes back to the um, hyperbole of the Russiagate thing. Um, the time at which the Democrats actually hired a body to look into um, where the source might have been. And after that happened, uh, it was deduced that it had to be an insider, technical reasons. Now, I, if, in attempting to explain this to other people who are still sort of, you know, caught up in that, that thing, find doing so. As a technical person, can you explain it to me? Yes. Um, first of all, you have a group who are former CIA intelligence agents, former uh, veterans, like people like Ray McGovern, uh, William Binney, who was the technical director of the NSA. So they formed a group called VIPS, V-I-P-S, Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. Now, they looked into all of that data. They even got the original DNC data. And what Binney saw there, he's the real technical expert, but it's something that I can understand, is formatting for either a USB stick or a hard drive. Now, you don't have, it's called FAT32. It's how you format. It's a cross-platform format if you want to transfer from Mac to PC. So whatever device was used for this, it, it had that formatting on it. It also was transmitted at, I think it was 8 megabits a second. And that is, at that point in time, it was too fast for the internet. And that is absolutely consistent with the speed of transfer to a USB stick. So that is why it's looking like it, it is uh, not a hack, but uh, it was a leak. But there's more. There's more about that. Um, Sean Henry, uh, who was head of CrowdStrike, who were managing the DNC servers, testified in 2017 
And what did he say in reply to Adam Schiff? We can't see any evidence at all that exfiltration, aka hack, took place. That there are, now that was kept secret, that was kept sealed. And that information, that statement, his testimony was only released three years later. And meanwhile, WikiLeaks is once again being accused of being involved with Russia. Hillary Clinton tried to bring a lawsuit, DNC lawsuit, against uh, the Trump campaign, Russian government, and WikiLeaks. And they got thrown out of court. It didn't, yeah, didn't even get standing. Thrown out of court by Judge Cottle, who is the same judge that is dealing with this Fourth Amendment case for the, the lawyers being spied on, right? Violation of their constitutional rights. So um, I think that, you know, sometimes these things go on for too long and then the damage is done. But I, there's so many people now that are concerned about this. And I think a lot of people are just searching for information all the time and the truth the truth comes out eventually. Thank you. Do, do we have another question? Um, my question is something I wonder all the time. Um, there's so much resentment from certain people about America, what they are doing to Julian Assange, literally slowly murdering him. Is this going to have any repercussions um, with the attitude towards America? like in Australia and around the world? Well, I mean, somebody said recently everyone hates America. <laughs> now, I didn't say that, but somebody said it. So, you know, people are not happy with that. But there are governments now, uh, Lula uh, from Brazil, other governments, Mexico, um, but all around the world, people in high places are putting pressure and our own Prime Minister has said, enough is enough. And, uh, you know, we don't know exactly what he was saying. I was in Brisbane yesterday, though, and Alba was there and he shook John's hand. I don't know if they exchanged any words, but, yeah, of course, uh, I think that maybe, I mean, journalists all over the world are threatened by this. I mean, if you're an Australian journalist and, and you release uh, some defence material, well... America claims that it has universal jurisdiction for the, this Espionage Act, and that dates back to 1961. It's, it's, it wasn't in the original 1917 law, but in 61 they introduced an amendment which said, we are the police of the whole world. We have universal jurisdiction. So any journalist in any country, if they're trying to do national security reporting, could easily be um, lifted. It all depends on the other countries, and especially for us, Australia, do we accept their universal jurisdiction? Do we ex extradite our citizens? They, America needs the consent of the rest of the world, but, you know, there's a, there was a terrible case, like, in, in the courtroom. Uh, a guy called Mendoza, he was Spanish, and Spain wanted him... Uh, they were ready to extradite, but the condition was that he was be sent back because Spain doesn't separate prisoners from their families. The family always, the family life is really important. They took um, 14 years. They were supposed to send him back straight away. And in fact, it, it got to the point. It went to the Supreme Court twice, and Mendoza won. And finally, Spain was going to, was saying, we're not going to process any more extraditions if you don't send this, this man home. And it still took a very long time, but that's what it came to in the end. Uh, so, you know, countries are not going to want to trust, uh, they're not going to trust America. The other thing that is really dangerous is the court can say one thing, but the Bureau of Prisons, advised by the CIA, can say something else. No, he's going, he's going to get SAMs, or he's going to be in communications management unit. And that's just the same. It's like a, a metal shoebox, as Mary Kostakidis called it. So, no, I don't think it's creating a very good impression. But there's other things that are making it worse for them. <laughs> uh, my question is about Anthony Albanese. 
Uh, how committed do you actually think he is to freeing Julian Assange? I mean, you said he said enough is enough, and I heard him say that, and I was quite uplifted by it. But then some months after that, when we had the AUKUS meeting, I would have thought the prime time for negotiation is when you're going to spend $860 billion on yeah. six submarines. Why couldn't he have then said, okay, we'll, we'll buy the submarines, but you released Julian in Yes. Uh, you know, and so, and what can we do to pressure him more to release Julia? Well, uh, he's a bit of a mystery man, really. But the thing is that his backbenchers, and you know, there's people, senators, uh, that they they are his. You know, the, the Bring Assange Home parliamentary friends of the Assange Group last year. Uh, sent a letter to uh, Biden. Hi, um, there's somebody, there's somebody who was, uh, yeah, he was speaking at uh, Senator Wish Wilson and Senator David Shubert. So there were six members of that group that were in Labour, and certain statements made. I mean, Albo's got no control over what this guy says, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I think we can keep getting out in the street. I think we can keep posting on social media and drawing as big a crowd as possible. This seems to be quite a success, this thing. Uh, people are interested in the interactivity. <laughs> right. Should I uh, make way for the senators? Thank you so much for your questions. Are we doing the duet, Pete? Is that what's happening? No, no, uh, I'll speak first, and then my good friend and colleague, Pete Wish Wilson, will speak next. Um, so I'm David Shoebridge, one of the Green Senators, and thank you for coming out today on Gadigal land and talking truth on Gadigal land. This always was and always will be. Um, I believe that the campaign to free Julian Assange is getting stronger and broader and more powerful. And I think what the community is doing, what the campaigners have been doing, for years and years and years, and sometimes feeling like you're yelling into the breeze and nobody's listening. Can I tell you now, people are beginning to hear this more loudly in Canberra and around the rest of the world. So keep doing what you're doing. It's actually an inspiration to Pete and me. Thank you. I, I see we've got David McBride here as well, and I want to acknowledge David and his courage. Um, and in acknowledging David and his courage, I think we should call out the lack of courage from our government. When quiet diplomacy is no diplomacy, when quiet diplomacy is a reason to do nothing, we've got a problem with our government, and that's the problem we have at the moment. And I can tell you now, there's an interesting collection down in the federal parliament of MPs from across the political spectrum who are looking to do something meaningful when we have Biden and the UK Prime Minister and Albanese all in the same place sometime later this month. Because... Those three men, and it is three men, between them can free Julian Assange in a heartbeat. And, and when our government keeps saying they can't interfere in the rule of law in the UK, that is a cop-out, and it's rubbish, and it's nonsense. Be because the Australian government has repeatedly, in other jurisdictions, in Iran, in a variety of other countries, and they've said it at the moment, actually, about Russia, about journalists in Russia. They have said they don't accept that the rule of law can grind through and jail journalists. And they think it's wrong in any court system, in any country in the world, to use the legal system to imprison and, and persecute journalists for doing their job as journalists. And that's what's happening in the United Kingdom now. And I don't care if they've got some UK law that says it's OK to extradite and jail journalists for the term of their natural life. If that's how that legal system works, we need to subvert it and we need our government to speak up against it and in support of Australian citizens. So there will be a critical moment, I think, in just a few short weeks when we have the three people on the planet who, between them, can free Julian Assange in the one place. And we should demand one outcome from those three people coming together is to free Julian Assange. So thank you very much for that. Bring him home. And I want to credit the work of my colleague, Senator Peter Wish Wilson, who has been working on this for years and years and years, genuinely committed to a peak.
Oh, thanks, Dave. I think I think Dave's pretty much covered what I was going to say, um, but I'd also like to uh, credit uh, previous Senator Scott Ludlam as well for all the, the amazing work he did flying the flag for Julian for so many years, and still is uh, with Flick Ruby and, and many other good people such as yourselves. Uh, the thing is, you never give in. You never give in, and you never give in. You keep pushing, and you keep pushing. Uh, and I do want to just mention very quickly, in the last week of, uh, the last day of Parliament three weeks ago, David Shoebridge here asked the question of Penny Wong uh, of whether um, Anthony Albanese had brought up the, the release of Julian Assange with Prime Minister Sunak and Joe Biden. Uh, her, her reason she gave for not, actually not answering the question uh, was that there's a legal process underway and they can't intervene, which of course is total crap. Um, and might have just been a coincidence, but the week following David's questioning of uh, Penny Wong, who, I must tell you, looked like a cat on a hot tin roof when she was asked that question in the Senate, uh, looked very uncomfortable indeed. The week after uh, David asked that question, um, Stephen Smith, ex-minister and uh, Labor minister, and I would consider you know pretty pretty heavy hitter in the Labor movement, uh, announced. Uh, that he was going to be visiting Julian Assange as our new ambassador to the UK, and he has visited Julian. And Julian's dad, John Shipton, uh, said he believed, and, and John's very optimistic, he believed this was the beginning of the end of the extradition process against his uh, wonderful son, Julian Assange. So, uh, as David said, when Biden's here in a few weeks' time, we've all got to come out in numbers and just keep that pressure on and make sure that this political persecution, one of the great... Uh, not just injustices, but one of the great abuses of power of our time comes to an end. Thank you. David McBride served two years in Afghanistan as an ADF lawyer, the first in 2011 and the next in 2013. What he witnessed during his deployment made him question the foundations of Australia's entire operation in the country. And he went to his superiors with these concerns, but nothing came of it. He raised these issues with the ADF officials. David was following the legal whistleblowing process set out in the Public Interest Disclosure Act of 2013, which dictates following a failed attempt to raise a corruption matter internally, a whistleblower can then go public with the information. Yet, in its function of providing whistleblowers with protection on having leaked classified information, the Public Interest Disclosure Act fails. David abided by the rules of the Australian defence. He lived up to the Australian ideals of truth, transparency, fair play and honesty. Yet David is now facing multiple national security and defence charges that can carry up to 50 years imprisonment and those that broke the rules of engagement have not been charged, let alone questioned or exposed. Please join me in giving David a warm welcome. I've said before... Um don't be afraid of being in a minority. It is a fantastic thing to win uh, a victory as a tiny minority over a majority. All the really good things uh, have been achieved by minorities. Abolition of slavery springs to mind and um, so many other good things. So we can be proud of the fact that you stood up for what is right. Well, press freedom today. I can see that there is a change. There's a change in the air for Julian Assange. Uh, he's been reported uh, about on Channel 9 and, and mainstream media, and it's a very exciting time. As I've said before, it won't be long before everybody claims to have been um, part of this campaign. But you're the people here who are really have been here from day one and you can be very, very proud of that. I mean, if nothing happens, even if I die in jail, as I said, you can be very proud of having stood up uh, for something that really mattered, for something uh, that was right and that's something your children and your grandchildren could be so proud of. Uh, it can never be right to put people in jail for telling the truth. You can never be right to put people in jail for exposing the murders of government officials. Uh, and what's more, if you don't stand up to those things, if we don't do something, it will just get worse. 
So it's not just a matter of doing things. In years to come, if we fail in this mission, anyone who's a dissenter against the government, dissenter against the corporations, will be jailed uh, and they will be murdered. That m must be wrong. That's obviously wrong. Uh, but the only way that is going to be changed is by people standing up. And often I hear people say things like, oh, what, what goes on in the war should stay in the war and soldiers doing their job is not something um, we want to criticise. But those same people wouldn't say that if it was their own son and daughter that was killed. They would come to us, they would come to people like you and me, and they would say, why aren't you doing something about it? My son is dead, my daughter's dead, I need help. I need help from you. Um, we do it anyway, we don't do it um, for accolades. Julian Assange, thank you my friend. There's another brave person in the crowd. And uh, people who are, are doing the right thing out there. Friendly Geordies, Declassified Australia, there's Peter Crownow. Uh, there are plenty of people who are doing the right thing. We will win this. It may mean me going to jail, uh, but I will eventually be let out of jail. And we will win this. Uh, and those of you who have who have been brave enough to stand up and to come out here and we see people walk past, see people don't care, see people look at us. But you will be very proud of what you've done and um, it'll be something that you can always look back on all through your life and say, I stood up, I was counted, I was part of that tiny minority, that 300 Spartans who stood up against the majority. Uh, for what mattered, and that is something uh, you can always, always be proud of. So thank you everybody for being here. Our next speaker up is Peter Cranwell. Peter, Peter is an investigative journalist, journalist currently a writer and co-founder of Declassified Australia. Australia. Peter was a successful producer for ABC TV's program Four Corners. Peter reports for ABC's radio background briefing, including a report in the Australia's hitherto secret involvement in the U.S. drone wars in the Middle East, titled Pine Gap's Roles in the U.S. Warfighting. Peter writes for Independent Australia, Michael West Media, Pearls and Irritations, along with many other esteemed media outlets. Peter has won numerous awards, including the Golden Walker on the political violence in East Timor in 2006. He's the co-editor of the current bestseller, A Secret Australia, revealed by the WikiLeaks exposés. Later this year, he will publish the base, Australia's secret role in America's global war. Please join me in welcoming Peter to the microphone. How ironic it is that on World Press Freedom Day, Julian Assange, the most notable uh, Australian journalist, is in the clink, top security, in London, in His Majesty's prison at Belmarsh. How ironic that today, on, on that very day, we're hearing from a whistleblower Dave McBride, who has spoken out to the media on crimes that he's seen, but is now facing jail. We live in a world where free speech is not as valued as you believe. Free speech, free media, they're terms that you hear bandied about on a regular basis, but they are concepts that need to be regularly fought for. And when I mean fought for, I mean people need to put their, their careers, their lives on the line. Some have done that. Someone like David, who you just heard from, spoke to the ABC in confidence, spoke to a couple of journalists from there, gave them a story about the Afghan files, the Afghan killings that have occurred over there. Lots of allegations that are now being investigated by the police, federal police. But he too has been investigated. The laws in this country are not in favour of whistleblowers. They're not in favour of the media speaking out. When the AFP came to the, a to the ABC, they wanted to handprint and fingerprint the two journalists who had been involved. They served a search warrant. They plugged in their laptop and searched the ABC entire network for keywords. 
one of the keywords they had was ABC. They had many keywords which were very general in, in form. And we don't know exactly what else they did because their warrant said that they could take information from the ABC server and that they could put information or something on the ABC server. We don't know if they did, which we have to trust them that they didn't. So that's how the truth about Afghanistan gets told. The whistleblower, the journalists are seen as criminals. Now with, with Julian Assange, they tried to kill him, the CIA. They set out to kill him, to murder him through poison, or perhaps if he tried to flee the, the embassy, through uh, uh, silenced machine guns uh, in, the, in their vehicles waiting outside the embassy. Is that how you treat information tellers, truth tellers? Apparently it is, but don't worry, our government's speaking up for him. He's going to be sprung at any minute, he said, hopefully. It's, it is World Press Freedom Day, but I've got to ask the question, what's so free about it? We're a lot better than many other countries, but boy, things are going backwards here. I've seen it inside the ABC, I've seen people stifled, I've seen the chilling effect of the ABC raids of the AFP raids on the ABC. So I think people really got to know that you can't take your freedoms for granted. And if you don't stand up for the, for the people as they get knocked off one by one, then they'll come for you, they'll come for all of us. We won't be able to uh, have the democracy we want. So on World Press Freedom Day, thanks for being invited along to this event. And I want to say good on you to the, to the organizers. Thanks for inviting me. And um, I just hope that, uh, that Press freedom uh, is, is a concept that does get supported and pushed and advocated for on a regular basis, even with a loud hailer. Thanks. I've got a couple of statements for, of support. What, the first one is from Anthony Lowenstein. Anthony Lowenstein is an Australian-German independent freelance investigative journalist, having written for the New York Times, The Guardian, The Washington Post, and Al Jazeera English, The New York Review of Books, and many others. He's also a co-founder of Declassified Australia. Anthony is also a filmmaker and a best-selling author. There are too many books to list here, but his latest release this year is The Palestine Laboratory, How Israel Exports the Technology of Occupation Around the World. His statement reads, I call on the Australian government to demand the release of Julian Assange back to his family. Instead of being in prison, he should be celebrated for informing us of the real actions of Washington and its allies. The next statement is from Gil Skrein. Gil Skrein has spent his life committed to bringing quality documentaries to the thinking digital audiences around the world. Gil's leadership as a community activist and writer on political and social issues, locally and globally, also informs his work as a teacher, filmmaking and distribution, and organizer of forums on filmmaking issues and practice. Gil's statement is, for revealing the war crimes, Julian Assange is in Belmarsh Prison. Australian journalists and publishers must speak out now. Free Julian Assange now! 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 Free Julian Assange now!